Thank you, guys. Um, when, when Dr. Bartell and Mrs. Dalby asked me if I would give this lecture, I felt like I had to say yes, because it is exactly what I am um, orienting my PhD studies around right now. But it immediately put me into a uh, quandary, because I've just started. I'm only, I think, in my fourth semester. And um, particularly in the discipline of history, it is really important that you not start research out with a thesis. If you start your research with a thesis, you are likely to try to prove your thesis, and therefore be less willing to follow the evidence wherever it leads. Let's see if I can mute my computer. Um, and so it's very tempting, especially with the like huge breadth of availability of articles and everybody's opinions and hundreds of years of books, to um, find what you want to find. And it's very important when being a good historian to not do that. And yet, I have to give a lecture, <laughs> so I have to have some sort of thesis um, that I can present. Um, so I decided to start out with sort of an operating question that, um, you guys can come on, don't worry about it, um, that is the part of the subject area that I am particularly interested in. Um, and that is uh, what effect has American history had on American theology? So what things are uniquely American about the way that we experience, particularly the Christian religion, um, and in what ways have those been shaped by our history? Um, this is not a new question. This is a field that many people are involved in. There's several famous names that you may have heard of, such as Mark Knoll, um, who's still operating and working, um, and uh, a lot of what I pull here is from his research. Um, George Marsden is also a big name. I muted you. Why? Um, in this as well. I'm going to get rid of my emails because that's what's doing this. Okay, there we go. Um, and so I'm indebted to their work in um, building some of this. But my goal today is to present to you a context in which all of us experience Christianity. Um, now, I also recognize that this is a really unique room to be doing this in. Um, the vast majority of American Christians are Protestant. The vast majority of those are evangelical. And in fact, many have argued, and we'll talk about this a lot um, today, that no matter what part of Christianity you are a part of, you have more Protestant evangelicalism in you than you realize, <laughs> because it is who we are as Americans. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. But I just wanted to recognize from the start that like some of you have grown up in church traditions that are very much different from what is the norm in American society. But I would argue that that doesn't make this less important because you are still growing up in America. And so there's many things that can shape all of these things um, no matter where you go to church. So I wanted to start by giving some early American context. Um, if you guys are ever interested in like old maps, Library of Congress has uh, tens of thousands of them. They're all fascinating. Um, this is a map that was drawn in 1910, but it is claiming to be about uh, probably early, well, mid to early 1500s. And I find it hilarious. Um, so this is the claims by several European countries. Sorry, I just forgot about the microphone. Um, several European countries. And it took me a while to decide what England was claiming. Um, I think the answer is everything. <laughs> so there's, this is mine now, is I think what they're doing. It's just written across the top. But you can see you have France coming down um, from Quebec all the way down to Texas. You have, of course, Spain sweeping through the uh, southwest here, and Russia who comes down from Alaska and makes it down to central California. Um, Russia comes late. They're in the about 1700s. Um, and you also don't have represented here the Dutch. The Dutch are also very involved, which we'll show when we get to the next map. Um, so in the first country to uh, claim their stake in Oh, I also wanted to say, I'm talking, I, this is titled American Religion, um, but I'm not able or equipped to address 
pre-colonial religion, right? That's a thing. That existed. Um, there were native tribes that had robust belief systems that continue to this day. I don't know anything about them. So we're going to be talking about colonial religion. Um, so you have uh, the Spanish are the first to land in, uh, you might know this date, 1492. Yes, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Uh, you probably won't know any of the other dates, but England is um, shortly behind them. What's interesting about the Spanish in particular, they land in 1492, but they are in California by 1542. Like they get, the, they, they make their way across the Southwest um, and they hold on to much of the Southwest for a long time. Um, you have uh, England <clears throat> arrives in 1497. An explorer named John Cabot is the first to officially set foot um, as, as an Englishman, though he was maybe Venetian, actually. Um, but he was paid for by the English. In 1614, the Dutch arrive, um, and France arrives in 1534. The English are the first to put a permanent, well, <laughs> an attempt at a permanent settlement in uh, the New World. Uh, that is the colony of Roanoke in 1585. Um, new, a new ship arrives in 1590, and Roanoke has disappeared. To this day, nobody knows what happened to those 100 colonists that were in that, um, in that attempted colony, <clears throat> but it lasted less than five years. So then, in 1607, you have the first successfully permanent colony in Jamestown. Um, Jamestown is in Virginia. It is a commercial colony. It's for the Virginia Company. They are most interested in, um, in the trade possibilities that come with the New World, as much of this is, right? The Spanish, the Dutch, um, the English are all interested in the financial opportunities, as well as truly worldwide empire. Um, empire. This is the age of exploration. Everybody's interested if they particularly can take over the entire world. So they're all trying to tempt, attempt that. Uh, Russia is attracted to Alaska because of the fur trade. So Alaska, um, someone discovers that there are many animals with fur on them in Alaska. And the Russian are like, that's mine now. And so then they, uh, they're there for a couple hundred years. Um, and I'm going to get to that in the end because there's a history of Orthodox missionary uh, activity in Alaska that is unique and fascinating. And we'll talk about it at the very end. So um, you have all these commercial enterprises. Um, let's see if we go to the next one. Um, and as also, <laughs> uh, yeah, so you have, this is where it starts to work out by the time of the French and Indian Wars. So Sp Spain has the Southwest. Um, th this original sort of construction is still observable in what our towns and streets and counties are named. Right? Like, if you look at the different sections of the US, you will see the languages of these original countries. I grew up in California and in Texas. I'm just used to Spanish being the thing we name things after. Um, Oregon country is super interesting. Every single person, except for England, or every single country, believes that they own Oregon. <laughs> so do the Russians. So just every single country is like, this is ours, and uh, Nobody's actually very successful until the Americans can take it over. Until manifest destiny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, everyone's racing to get to Oregon because every, every, everybody wants it. Um, but we've talked about the commercial enterprises that start. Um, of course, that is not the primary history of the colonies, though. Um, the English colonies in particular start to really grow and take off 13 years after Jamestown when the pilgrims arrive. Um, the American pilgrims are a religious minority out of England. They're Puritans. Um, they are dissenters from the Church of England who have been uh, persecuted in England. They moved up to Holland for a little while, but then eventually decided they wanted to establish their own place in the New World. Um, there are two things that are really important about the pilgrims. The first is who they actually were, which I just described but they have an outsized influence on American history because of the mythos that we have created around the pilgrims. That's not to say it's false or true. It's just epic, right? Like, we, like these paintings I picked out because they're sort of classic like myth-building images. You've got the first Thanksgiving here. There's the 
Native Americans over there, everybody's praying and there's babies and it's all very good. Um, you have the um, uh, Massachusetts Bay. This is the Mayflower here in the middle. Um, but you have the, what do, they, what do they call that? The, it's the contract they make. Um, hmm? Yeah, yeah. Um, to start a city on a hill in Massachusetts. Um, by the way, the first baby born uh, on the Mayflower in the Americas was named Peregrine White, who is my direct ancestor. It's not important except for that. So, uh, but he's the first baby born in the Americas. That's cool from, to an English family. Um, but as, as we know from like all of our studies of Greek and Roman myth or English mythology, if you've just walked through the Arthurian legends, like the myths we tell, the stories we tell about ourselves are important. They shape how we think about ourselves, whether we intend to or not. And so there is this strong sense in um, the building of the Americas, from, especially in the English colonies, from the very beginning, that we are set apart, that we are intentional, that we have come here to build something new, to build something where we can uh, freely express and practice our faith. And this is not not true. Like as we start working through the various groups that come um, to America, th this story repeats itself over and over again for a variety of people. Um, but the, the pilgrims sort of set the stage that is greatly embraced by, um, by the American people in later years. Uh, the Puritans are separatists, as I said, from the Church of England. They're Calvinist, um, strong, strongly Calvinist. And, of course, they're known as the Puritans. They have strict um, both theological and social um, expectations for themselves and for one another. Um, uh, this, oh, wait, there we go. Um, I somehow put an animation in the titles of my slides that I don't know how I did it. And I didn't know how to get rid of it, so uh, you'll just enjoy them coming on late. Um, this is sort of a dumb <laughs> to, but easy to read breakdown from, I think, National Geographic or something um, that shows the makeup of the English colonies. Um, all of them have a distinct religious identity. So you start out, um, the, the pilgrims, the Puritans, start in Massachusetts, and they move northward. Um, they partially move northward because they start separating from one another, and so they have to start banishing people up to farther north. Um, and so you get, particularly the Baptists, nobody likes the Baptists. Everybody keeps shoving them out. Um, so they have to keep making their own places. So, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Malachi. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you, have to, you have to sit over there. That's, yeah. Um, so the uh, Puritans started in Massachusetts. Uh, baptism really is a major controversy. Um, the, the Puritans, like most of Christianity, practiced infant baptism. Uh, a sect of that starts to say, no, only believers baptism. And they're like, get out of here. And so that's what goes northward. So you have Rhode Island as a separatist Baptist um, settlement. Uh, Connecticut um, is a kind, it, it, it's, a, it's a brand of... Um, Puritanism that is very strong to this day called Congregationalism. Um, one of their hallmarks is, um, well, we'll talk about this a lot, but a, uh, a, a lack of ecclesiastical structure. Um, you're not going to see Congregationalists that have bishops. That, no way. It is all about the people in the church who are coming together to bring their leaders, um, pick their leaders, and then kick their leaders out. Uh, which they also like to do. Uh, you have the Quakers, um, who are, again, a separatist group that nobody else likes, so they have to start their own thing in New Jersey. Um, the, the northern colonies have this primarily Calvinistic Puritan um, strain. The middle colonies, which are often defined as New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, they were originally settled by the Dutch, who actually practiced a kind of religious tolerance that um, many countries didn't yet do. So England becomes more religiously tolerant, but the Dutch kind of started out that way. And so a lot of the people who can't even get along with the ones that they started out with um, start to settle in these middle colonies. So you get the Quakers, um, the Dutch Reformed, and separatists of that sort. You also, in Maryland, get a distinct um, Roman Catholic settlement. 
So Maryland is settled by English Roman Catholics who are also being persecuted, and so they come to start their own um, place. And uh, the Lutherans um, out of Germany are in Delaware as well. And then the South is settled by Anglicans. So you start to get people who have moved for um, the opportunity to grow and live in the New World, but they're not a persecuted sect. They're still very connected to England. And they expect, in fact, England to send them bishops. They expect to recreate the Anglican Church and be connected to the Old World through the Anglican Church um, imminently. Uh, it never happens, which we will, we will get to that in a minute. But the, the Anglicans are not trying to be separatists from England. They are happy um, to be a part of it. Now, what's interesting about this is it means that the English colonies, which become the tone setters for the rest of the westward expansion, are all, or at least largely made up, of passionate dissenters. They are people who have come here for a purpose, and they have no problem <laughs> saying, I'm not going to be a part of that. I am going to start this. And they really believe what they believe. And so to this day, American Christians tend to be some of the most committed and passionate Christians. It's why you see a fall off in Christianity in Europe that really hasn't yet happened here. Um, because we have always been a nation that very much embraces um, faith, particularly Christian faith. Uh, Johnny, Johnny, and George. So that's the, the, the beginning of what I wanted to focus on is sort of these foundations that set us up to be independently minded when it comes to forming our faith and our Christianity. Um, within about, well, I don't know, all these guys are about 1730s to 1750s, you start to see the next major development um, that shapes American Christianity to this day, and that is the Great Awakening. Um, so the, uh, the colonies are now very well established. You have maybe as many as um, two million people uh, living in the colonies in the 1730s, well-established towns, fairly well-established government, um, and many, many, many churches. Um, anyone know the last names of these people? And they're not in order, so. Incorrect. All right, who's Wesley? Yeah, John Wesley is on the end there. Anybody else? In the middle is George Whitfield, and this is Jonathan Edwards. Um, if you know anything about these three men, there's something unusual about crediting them with the shaping of American Christianity. Do you have any guesses? Two of them aren't American. So we're going to talk about why they came to shape American theology so much. Um, so the first is George Whitfield. Okay, guys, George Whitfield. <laughs> Every painting of him looks like this. And I was like, are people just being mean? Like, why, why is it? But then I found, so he, does, he has a lazy eye, and it's well known in his history. Um, he doesn't have any problem with sight. He's, he can see perfectly well. Um, but uh, I'll tell you why that's important in a minute. He... Um, is an Anglican minister. He's a Calvinist Anglican minister out of England. Um, he is, uh, becomes best friends with the uh, Wesley brothers um, in uh, Christchurch at Oxford, and they start something called the Holiness Club. Um, they get really interested. I know. Don't they sound fun? Just real, real party. Um, they start something called the whole. It is wildly unpopular. They, they were not well-liked. Um, they start something called the Holiness Club at Christ Church, um, where they are exhorting their fellow undergraduates that their faith has gone lax, right? Like they are not, they don't care about Christianity, they are not passionate about Christianity, and the Wesley brothers, John and Charles and George and their compatriots, um, become very interested in why the church doesn't seem like the church that you see in Acts? Why is the passion died out? Why is this all just um, ceremony and ritual and no one seems to abide by it when they're at home? Right? This is their major complaint. They, um, they want to see a uh, passionate revival of Christianity um, in England in the beginning. Um, so he, is, he, is, he has this lazy eye. George Whitfield um, has an amazing talent, 
and that is his public speaking. Um, not just uh, in what he has to say, but how he says it. He is known to have spoken to crowds of 80,000 people within an age of no microphones, but everybody could hear him. And his lazy eye developed this legend that no matter where you were in the crowd, he was looking at you. <laughs> so everyone felt very personally convicted by, <laughs> by his, uh, his sermons. Um, you uh, see a quote by him down here. We can preach the gospel of Christ no further than we have experienced the power of it in our own hearts. Uh, I was sifting through uh, his writing to pick out something. One that I almost put on here is that our congregations have died because dead men preach in them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so other pastors did not love him, but the people loved him. Um, and so he starts a tour of England. He starts preaching in the open air because nobody wanted him in church. Um, and he's attracting these crowds. So he decides to go to America in 1740. And he has this idea that um, because the preaching of Christ can never be divorced from what you do in your practical life, he's going to start an orphanage. And he's going to start an orphanage for black children, enslaved children who've recently become freed or whose parents have died. Um, it's called the Bethesda Orphanage. Uh, he raises the money for it. Um, I think it's, I mean, it still exists to this day. Um, and he does, in fact, build it and plant it. He is a very interesting figure when it comes to race in America because he always included black Americans in his sermons. He was happy to have them in the crowd, happy to have them in church. He wanted to serve them, but he was also a slave owner. Um, and so there, there's a little bit of a, um, a dissonance in his belief. Now, he also preached against the cruelty to slaves, but he himself owned, um, owned slaves. Uh, this is not true of the other two. John Wesley and Jonathan Edwards are, are avid abolitionists. And because they all know each other, this is an area of conflict um, for them. Uh, George Whitfield comes to the United States. He starts his open, hour, his open air preaching, and he is a sensation. He starts this uh, path from New York, and they suspect he is the person who is ridden on horseback the longest and farthest because he starts in New York, and he rides all the way down to South Carolina preaching the entire time. Um, so he sort of just makes this huge swath down the United States, and, um, uh, and he, he is, he's drawing these massive crowds. Um, as I said, he is an Anglican minister. He has no desire to separate from the church. He, he wants to reform Anglicanism from within. Uh, his friend, John Wesley, um, is back in England. Uh, the Wesley brothers, I know you've probably all heard of them. John Wesley is born in 1703. Um, his mother, Susanna Wesley, is incredibly awesome. Uh, we have collections of her letters. They are well worth reading. Uh, she was the 25th child of a dissenting minister in England. Uh, she then went on to, he, but he, he educated all of his children very well, including his daughters. She went on to marry Samuel Wesley, who was an Anglican minister and had 19 children, um, nine of whom live into adulthood. Uh, she homeschools all of them so that by the age of five, they are fluent readers in English, and then they go on to read Greek and Latin. Um, uh, and they also memorize, all of her children memorize large portions of the New Testament. So this is, this is the environment in which John and Charles are raised. Their parents are very serious about their faith. They're also just a fascinating family. So they live in this rectory because their dad is a minister. Um, and then when John Wesley is five years old, the, West, the Wesley's home catches fire. And uh, Samuel and Susanna are able to get all of their children out of the house except for John. He's stuck on the third floor. And he's five years old, and they think that he will, he's, he's gone, right? He's going to be dead. Um, congreg uh, their congregants see the fire happening, come rushing to help, and men standing on each other's shoulders get through the upstairs window and grab John out and save his life. And so from that day forward, uh, John Wesley refers to himself as a brand plucked from the fire. And he sees this, and his parents see this, as like evidence of a call on his life. He has been miraculously rescued when no one thought he would, 
And from that day forward, really, as even as a very young child, his parents and himself say, I am here for a purpose. Um, they also believed the rectory to be haunted. Um, they all talk about it, but they have a very friendly relationship with this situation. They call him Old Jeffrey and refer to it fairly casually throughout many of their uh, letters to one another, like, Old Jeffrey's doing this. Um, so no one seems particularly bothered. He's around for a couple years, and then he goes away. So do without what you will. Uh, as a friend of George Whitfield's, um, Charles and John Wesley, uh, Charles Wesley is, of course, known for his hymns, um, but John and Charles work very closely together. Um, they are founding members of the Holiness Club. They're good friends with George Whitfield. George goes to England or to America, and he says, you guys have to come here. And so they do. And they come to Georgia, and John Wesley believes that maybe this is, this is the call. This is what I was saved for. I am going to be a missionary to the Native Americans. And so he goes to Georgia. His plan is to go Georgia down to Florida, and this will be his life, is in service of the Native Americans. Well, the Native Americans did not actually like him very much. Um, so that didn't go as well as he had hoped. Um, he then starts as a minister to an Anglican congregation there. He falls in love but decides that um, with this call in his life, he should not get married um, to this woman. I think her name was Jane. She marries somebody else, and he's, he starts to find reasons to deny her communion. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know, Jane, I don't think you're doing, you know, and so they kick him out. They're like, get out of here. Like, be gone with you. So John and Charles, after this failed uh, missionary trip, they're in the Americas for two years. Um, they head back to England. Um, one of the things that ends up being most influential about this trip is who they are on the ship with. So on their way back to England, they're with German Moravian Christians. And the Moravians are a pietistic, evangelical branch of um, Protestant Christianity. They emphasize this idea of a new birth, right? Like once you become a Christian, you are renewed, you are a new creation, and they really mean it. And John is amazed by the faith and the passion of the Moravians. He says they pray long into the night. They sing. They love one another. And he feels this conviction of, like, I, I'm not like that. I've never been like that. I don't care the way they care. What is, what is, what is wrong with me? So he and Charles, once they get back to England, um, to London, they start... Um, joining the Moravians in the worship services. And uh, famously, um, oh, I didn't write the year. I wrote May 24th, so there you go. Um, famously on May 24th of some year, he, uh, he goes to a meeting in Aldersgate, in a part of London, um, where he finally feels this sort of anointing of the Holy Spirit. And that's how he identifies it. Like he understands for the first time that God is truly with him. And he says, my heart was strangely warmed, which becomes a famous phrase in American religion and literature. Um, this sort of post-conversion, conversion experience um, then sets Wesley up to be the next great revivalist. So like George, he starts open-air preaching. Um, he too is very dedicated to his church. He has no desire to split from the Anglican church. In fact, um, of those of you who just read Christian Perfection, like one of the great warnings he gives against um, like an evidence of sin is, is being a schismatic, right? Like that, that would be a, a, a sign that you are not yet redeemed and perfected. Um, so he, he very much wants to stay within the Anglican fold. He is a reformer, but not a dissenter. Um, but he is passionately convicted that the life of the Christian has to be defined. It has to be um, just fully devoted to practical, daily, transformed lives. Like if you are not living out your faith, then what are you doing? Um, he wants to see personal devotion. He wants to see passionate lives. Um, he loves the Anglican liturgy. He loves the Anglican liturgy. He is sacramental. He believes in the primacy of the priesthood. Um, he believes in apostolic succession. All of these things are he writes about widely. But the spirit of 
what he wants to see in the church and the reform that he wants to see and the revival that he wants to see starts to come into conflict. And he decides, despite his own belief in all of those qualities of the church, that it is too important to make sure that people are saved. So he starts ordaining outside of the church's, uh, um, church's authority uh, his own ministers. They all want to be Anglicans, but he is most interested in who can actually pre preach the gospel and who's going to go do it. And so he starts ordaining these ministers, and there is a sect within Anglicanism that starts to call, get called the Methodists. And that's because they believe in this daily practice of Christianity. And he writes um, long essays on the... And it's, it's fascinating to read about the structures of his churches. Um, the idea of small groups, of accountability groups, of all, it's, all, it's all Methodism. Like, it's all part of the daily practice. He believes that pastors should be checking on their flock every day. You just walk through the village, knock on doors, say, how's it going? Um, so he has these, he's these strict beliefs for pastors. So in 1744, the first Methodist conference um, convenes in England. Um, they are still Anglicans, but they are now at this point pretty distinct from the mainline Anglican um, church. And uh, in this way, Wesley's story is sort of a, a classic Protestant and evangelical story, right? He, he doesn't want to split, but he is willing to split if it is in order to follow his conviction, um, if it is order to do the work that he thinks God has called him to do. Um, Wesley also starts to split from George Whitfield. As I mentioned, he is an abolitionist. Um, he does not believe in slavery. He's very vocal about it. Um, but he is also, shocker of shocker, Arminian. So unlike many of the Calvinist Anglicans, and George Whitfield in particular, he starts to preach that it is possible, not only is your own will the most important part of how you devote yourself to Christ, but it is possible to become truly sanctified and actually perfect in this life. That this idea of original sin is not the defining feature of the human person, that their ability to unify with God is. And so he writes on Christian uh, perfection, which we're reading today, and um, wildly unpopular, uh, but he continues, and he and, and George kind of go their separate ways. Um, Wesley uh, finishes out the ministry of his life in England. He, he lives um, a long time. He dies in 1791, so he's like 87 years old. Um, hugely, massively influential as both a reformer and a um, founder of the Methodists. Um, but the Methodists then become schismatic against the Anglicans, and they all move to the southern United States. So you, in just post-revolution, really, you start to see a huge boom in Methodist immigration into the southern states, and it becomes a major force of American Christianity. Jonathan Edwards. Um, it is, I think, impossible to understand America or American Christianity well without knowing Jonathan Edwards. Um, Jonathan Edwards defined, um, def defined what it meant to be the truly low church, Puritan, Congregationalist that America was known for. Um, he comes from Puritan roots. He um, is, starts, he's also a freaking genius. So he is uh, of a pretty prominent, well-known family. He's very, very well-educated at home. He ends up at Yale at 13 years old, um, he, which is unusual even then. And at 13 years old, he reads John Locke, and it transforms his life. Uh, he reads Concerning Human Understanding, and he uh, really embraces this idea that knowledge is available to us. That like we, we are perfectly capable of understanding the world around us and that this kind of practical epistemology is important as he starts to think about his theology. He's a polymath genius. He um, studies just about everything he can think to study. Um, he loves to learn. He loves to think. And he becomes one of the first sort of scholastic theologians of the Americans. Um, he's very foundational to Presbyterianism. Um, that maintains this sort of Jonathan Edwards style study till you die uh, to this day. Um, 
and he also helps launch the Great Awakening. He um, is a pastor in New England, but he is un- he's unhappy. He is unhappy with the lax sort of blasé tenor to his congregants' faith. He thinks that they don't understand the truly salvific work of Christ that is available to them. He is tired of seeing the sort of complacency in his church, and he hears about something that's happening across the river. This man named George Whitfield is preaching, and he's drawing thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And this revival starts um, across the river. And so Jonathan Edwards goes, and he starts talking to Whitfield. Um, he and Whitfield agree on a lot in their theology, even though Whitfield is Anglican and Edwards is um, a Puritan. Uh, they're, both, they're both strongly Calvinist, but they're both, more importantly, deeply committed to this life of personal faith, and they want to see that enacted in the Americas. Um, Edwards is a little skeptical of the... Um, huge heights of emotion and excitement that George is perfectly willing to whip everybody up into. Uh, He would prefer that we stay a little less enthusiastic, Um, but he is greatly influenced and impressed by the conviction and the change he starts to see in the lives of the villagers. Um, So he joins this movement and starts preaching in the open air. He starts preaching in a variety of congregations. He's hugely well-respected and popular, so people want to come to his sermons. Um, he, <laughs> he is, in a way, outsizedly known for a single sermon that is not actually very typical of his theology. But you guys have all have heard of it. It's called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. He preaches this sermon at a church um, in 1741. Um, in, contrast, in, uh, in contrast to Whitfield, he is said to have been, and this may be the, so something of the stuff of legend, but he is said to have stood perfectly still, looked at the bell rope at the end of the belfry and not at anyone else, and spoke in a whisper. But the words were so powerful that people started falling out of their chairs and weeping because they felt the conviction of their sin. Um, Sinners in the Hands of the Angry God is much criticized and much lauded, depending on what side you're coming from. Um, But I think it's important to point out that in Edward's context, um, he makes a lot of, he makes a big deal about the fact that, like, the people of New England know the gospel. They know where to find salvation. They just don't seem to think they need it. And so with that emphasis, he wants to show them their sin. He wants to say, no, you know who Jesus is. You don't know yourself. So, like, I am going to show you what you are actually like to the face of God. And that's where Sinners comes from. Um, He should be much more well-known for his work such as the religious affections. Um, This quote comes from religious affections. The essence of all true religion lies in holy love, and that in this divine affection and an habitual disposition to it. Those things which are the first fruits of it consist the whole of religion. Religious Affections is a beautiful, beautiful theological text where he is exhorting his fellow Christians that if you don't actually act as if you are truly in love with God, you may need to question if you understand him. Like if your life is not typified by love and devotion, you probably are not understanding God or connected to him properly. And so he argues for this work of the heart that has to take place um, within the lives of the believers. Um, He starts to hold his congregation to higher and higher moral standards with this in mind. Um, He institutes closed communion, um, which for the Congregationalists is very unpopular. And so he um, says that if you, like, if you are not, everybody knows each other. If you're not living right, you're not getting communion until you confess and repent. Um, if we don't know you, we don't know what your faith is like, you're not getting communion. Um, so something that would seem pretty normal to you guys um, was very unusual there. And uh, eventually his, his congregation and the ministers that are all part of it, uh, part of his association, kick him out. 
Um, so he's like, get out of here. We don't want you anymore. Um, however, at this point, he is fairly well-known and famous. Um, he starts to get calls from all over. Um, he becomes a missionary to the Native American people for a while. Um, but then his son-in-law asks him to become the, pres uh, the president of Princeton. And so he becomes the third president of uh, Princeton College, or New Jersey College at the time, eventually Princeton University. As I said, I think it's an, uh, impossible to understand American history and theology without Jonathan Edwards. It's also impo impossible to write a musical about American history without Jonathan Edwards. Uh, someone want to read poor Aaron Burr's role here? And then the rest of you, okay. All right, Malachi's up. And the rest of you, you're the chorus, so you're going to read what's in the parentheses, all right? Amazing. Well done. Who's his grandfather? Jonathan Edwards. Uh, Aaron Burr Jr. is the grandson of Jonathan Edwards. I think Lynn Manuel is amazing. Mr. Gilbert and I were talking about this the whole way here. It is amazing that he makes this connection. He sets up the character of Aaron Burr Jr. as someone who is living up to a legacy he doesn't understand, right? He, he says, oh, there's things that the homilies and hymns won't teach you. But Aaron Burr Jr. is a black spot on the family. Like uh, George Marsden talks about, Ed, <laughs> about Edward's descendants. Um, the Edwards family produced scores of pastors 13 presidents of colleges and universities, 65 professors, and many others of the highest achievement. Burr is an outsider here, and Grandpa would not approve, right? He would not approve of the affairs, he would not approve of the murder, and so in Hamilton, <laughs> you see a man who is struck, and then like this song especially is, he starts to compare himself to Alexander Hamilton who has no reputation, he has no family to live up to, and yet it's th this weight is crushing Burr. It's just, it's just genius. So Jonathan Edwards, next time you're hearing it, that's who, that who he's talking about. Um, so this is some of the defining features of the Great Awakening. And the Great Awakening becomes um, a hallmark of American Christianity. I liked this. This is actually a plaque from England, uh, but it says, On this site, the Reverend John Wesley preached from a butcher's block. 26th of June. The best of all is God is with us. Um, this is exemplary of the kind of preaching that Edwards and Wesley and Whitfield, um, there's people I didn't talk about like Gilbert Tennant, um, a lot of others. Uh, this is the first Great Awakening. A hundred years later, you have the second Great Awakening um, where a whole new generation of evangelists comes up, such as Moody, who starts Bible colleges, um, our, the university that many of us went to in California was founded um, by some of the products of the Second Great Awakening who became evangelists and um, missionaries. Um, the, so we have the foundations and movements of early American religion um, in the colonies, those, that sort of display of the different Christian sects of dissenters um, sort of trains her people in democratic ideals. So you have people who are very willing to throw off ecclesiastical structure if they do not think it is in accordance with their belief. People of revival, the next generation of Christians, are willing to resist this ecclesiastical structure in favor of personal conviction. If the church is not allowing you to follow Jesus, get rid of the church. Go to the field, listen to the preacher. Um, I loved this quote I found in some research. Uh, it's a uh, English general writing from occupied New York during the revolution. He says, Presbyterianism is really at the bottom of this whole conspiracy. It has supplied it with vigor and it will never allow it to rest. He is identifying the Protestant dissenting nature of 
the um, colonial people as the very reason why they are willing to pursue revolution. Um, this is something of a, uh, a controversy in American history right now. Um, for the last, I'd say, 80 to 100 years, there's been this push to see the founders as a very much uh, secular sort of um, a classically liberal generation of philosophers who are most influenced by the Greek and Roman democracies and republics and want to build that in the new world. A new generation of American historians is saying, I don't think you have the whole picture. Um, these men, these people, the American people in particular, are defined by their Christianity. And it would not have occurred to them to separate that from political belief. And so if your church, if what is important to you is the, the local community, the structures that you have in place, your convictions, um, they are perfectly willing to bring that to a democratic governmental society. Uh, but this, this is a bit of a, of a debate. Um, how much was this Protestantism? I mean, some people ask, was it the most influential force that causes American Revolution? Um, the colonists, of course, see themselves as Englishmen, primarily. They are revolting um, because of their rights as English people. Um, they think that England is violating those rights. They don't see themselves as different. They see themselves as give us the rights that we deserve as, as, as the English-speaking people. Um, but at least one general identifies Presbyterianism as the real problem. Um, I don't remember what my next slide is. Oh, good, yeah. Uh, Edmund Burke. All Protestantism is a kind of dissent. This religion is under a variety of denominations, agreeing in nothing but the communion in the spirit of liberty. Uh, you see a connection made. Now, this is Edmund Burke praising the colonists, by the way. This is a speech he's giving on conciliation with the colonies. He is saying, like us, Anglicans, Protestantism is fine with dissent. We believe in the rights of man. We do not believe that the hierarchy dictates that. We believe that each man has his inherent right, and their Protestantism has trained them in this belief. So you're not going to win, is what he's saying. You're not going to win this war. Um, I, I almost included a bunch of quotes from uh, Alexander de Tocqueville. He kind of famously comes through the Americas as a Catholic Frenchman and is amazed by their faith. Um, he has some really funny things to say. Like, they don't seem to understand it very well, but they all live it out very much. I was like, yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> um, so in this sort of, these broad um, sweeps that we we're looking at today, um, I think I want you to take away this idea of s the spirit of revival and the spirit of dissent as being particularly important to American theology. Um, personal application and conversion uh, being, oh, I didn't mention, uh, one of the things that Wesley comes to uh, midway through his kind of journey of building up um, his later theology, I do not want virus protection. Um, he calls himself, uh, he says, I am now homo unius libri. What is it? A man of one book. Libri book, yeah. A man of one book, the Bible. That's what he says. And so this, there is this, um, and, and George Whitfield will emphasize that. Jonathan Edwards will certainly emphasize that. Um, there's this uh, emphasis on scripture and on personal holiness. Um, there are also many places where they disagree. Calvinism and Arminianism um, becomes a rabid debate um, in American religion. Uh, the use of emotion um, if you read 1700s theology and someone is called an enthusiast, that is an insult. <laughs> not a fan. Like Edwards, Wesley, they do not like enthusiasm. Um, they think of it as a sort of like created emotion that's not actually centered on theology. Um, and they want to see a form of worship that is reflected in your behavior. They, don't, they're, they're, they have no time for people who go to church on Sundays and don't live it out in their life. Um, these, of course, are classic, classic elements of evangelicalism. 
And um, in the last 10 years, uh, historian Mark Knoll, he wrote a book called America's God. And he suggests and has become a very powerful, why are we confused? Oh, oh, okay, wait, before that. The other thing we're willing to do is break from each other, right? This is PCUSA's self-published chart of Presbyterian denominations. I thought it was hilarious, um, but they like, there's all these loops and strings and it's just people breaking from each other, rejoining, breaking again. Um, this is, yeah, they're 1706 to present. Um, it is very hard to track, no, it's not impossible, but uh, tracking evangelical and uh, Protestant denominations often looks like this um, because very, very willing to break from one another if we don't think that you're living right. All right, so Mark Knoll in his book America's God suggests that American people, um, all people, not just Christians, the American people are uniquely shaped, are uniquely um, influenced by what he calls the American synthesis. And this is something he thinks is a unique combination of, who's this dude in the middle? No, no. It's Dave... David Hume, yeah, uh, that's Hume, uh, that jerk, he's, uh, uh, the American people are very influenced, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of immigrants from England and Scotland, of course, that come to the United States, and they bring with them common sense rationalism, uh, so again, it's a very democratic uh, epistemology, it says that every man can come, up, come to know things for himself, and that what's important is, the, is that you do. You do know your, your things for yourself. David Hume says his philosophy is for the man of action, not the man of just sitting around under a tree thinking about stuff. You, and he's, he's a jerk. But uh, he, uh, he, uh, he's pretty proud of himself. Uh, so the American synthesis is this common sense rationalism that every man is the arbitrator of his own belief and his own understanding of knowledge, um, of republican government. Americans... Um, have always been passionate Republicans. Like there has never been a major monarchist movement in the United States. Nobody's interested in that. Everybody wants democratic government and we believe in it as if it was a religion, right? Like the, the writings of the founding fathers, especially you get to second great awakening, um, civil war era, like e even, even the civil war is generated by what does it mean to be an American? Like, what, what is the future of our country? What rights are important to us, right? There's, there's, um, they're passionate about their government. Um, the third thing that comes together to form this American synthesis is, in Mark Knoll's belief, evangelical Christianity. It doesn't matter if you are Catholic or Orthodox, if you are Anglican, if you do not consider yourself an evangelical. He would say you have been greatly greatly influenced by evangelical Christianity. That is the context in which we live as Americans. We come together and we sort of, from the cradle, are influenced by this synthesis of rationalism, republicanism, and evangelicalism. This is what makes up the American people, makes them unique um, to who they are. Now you can, you can argue with that, I think one should argue with it, um, but Marsden is pulling this from a historical context. He's not saying that each of you are personally um, oriented that way. He's saying this is, this is the world you live in. Um, and so I think as we think about our own churches, like I said, whether or not you're Orthodox or Catholic or Protestant, um, it's very interesting to me how this may have influenced the way we practice those parts of our faith. Um, one of the things I might study um, is obviously Orthodox um, churches in America are technically united, but they do not act that way very often. We have a very odd um, jurisdiction situation. I have a hunch that that might be because of this, right? We're, we're really interested in independence. There, there's not a huge drive towards unity and and if you're like pretty okay with one another but you don't feel the need to have the same leadership you don't it's just it's very american <laughs> it's a very american uh thing to do um the spirit of not my pope that comes up in the roman catholic church 
That's very American, very American to be like, not that guy. And you're like, what? That's not your thing. That yes, that guy's your guy. Like, like yeah, yeah. So I think this influence um, is strong. Is strong in all of us. Um, and I also think, especially for those of us who are Protestant and evangelical, I think it's very important to ask: In what ways am I being more American than I am being apostolic? More American than I am being. Christian, <laughs> like more American than I am being part of the one holy Catholic and apostolic faith. Because we're very, that this is the context that we have grown up in, and Americans tend to be strongly American, which is a great thing, um, but influences all of us. So um, I guess I have like five minutes if you have any questions. You were asking the million dollar question. Um, evangelical Christianity is amorphous on purpose, so it's a little hard to answer that. It's all, but it's defined by a few things. It's voluntary association. So you won't have a strong, like, there's, no gonna, there's not gonna be an evangelical Christian bishop. Uh, even when there sort of is, like my sister is a part of a network of mega, mega churches that I'm like, that guy's your bishop, right? Like, he's your bishop. You have all these little pastors that are in their individual churches, and the teaching comes from this guy. Like, that, that's an ecclesiastical structure, but we don't recognize it as such. Um, evangelicals are very interested in the um, personal application of faith, in the saving work of Christ, and in you accepting that saving work for yourself. So you have to say, um, you have to hear the gospel, you have to say, that is mine, I take on Jesus, and that is part of my life now. Um, so any, any part of Christianity can be evangelical, um, but evangelicals themselves are those who will get out, they're, they're very interested in the saving of souls and what that means for your life. So they're not in Yeah. Yeah, in fact, all of those that we looked at would be largely evangelical. Yeah. Um, Orthodoxy is actually was something that was interesting to me about orthodoxy is that orthodoxy tends not to be, right? Like orthodoxy is much more like, you'll come to us if you need us, right? Like here we are, here's who we are, come on in, but like we're not, we're not making you. And evangelicals are like, we're making you. <laughs> Get in here. <laughs> yes. You were going to mention um, orthodoxy as sort of... Um, oh, yeah. Northwestern... Mm -hmm. Okay, so the one thing I did want to tell you, because I thought it was so interesting, um, especially of those who read, what is it, Las Casas? Um, okay, so I was reading, I was like, I want to I include the Orthodox influence. Um, we'll go back this way. But Orthodoxy comes about two, uh, the Russians show up about 200 years later than the other groups I mentioned, than the French, the Dutch, the English, and the Spanish. Um, and they come to the wrong side. <laughs> so they show up in Alaska because they're interested in, um, in the fur trade, and they make their way down Canada into, into Northern California. They clash with the Spanish, and they instantly start marty, martyring each other. Um, but here's what I wanted to tell you, because I thought it was just fascinating and beautiful. Um, read about any missionary movement. The Spanish are classically rightly, I think, blamed for this, um, but Protestants in Africa are blamed for this, you see a kind of militant become Spanish or die. Become Spanish or die. Become Catholic or die. Become evangelical or die. Become Dutch. Like that kind of, the, the Orthodox do not do this. So even in totally secular literature that doesn't understand Orthodoxy, they recognize that the Orthodox use this missionary technique that is beautifully holy. <laughs> like they come down through Alaska and the fur traders are not super great to the Alouettes. They start to immediately like make them serfs. Um, but the missionaries come in and try to stop it. So they almost immediately stop a lot of it because the, the trappers are actually respectful of the priests. Um, they start missions and they start schools. They also start to learn the Alouette language instantly and help them write it. So they make it a written language, and then they start translating the Bible into it. They translate Lives of the Saints into it. They start building up um, a written library of Alouette Orthodox materials. And then they start training and ordaining priests in the native peoples. So this is now what any missionary organization of any site would want to do. That, that's what we have learned of like, you have to embrace the native culture. The native culture is never going to be against God. Like, if they want to be a Christian, God can let them be a Christian in their context. 
that's fine. And the Orthodox did this from the very beginning. So if you, you don't, like, it's actually hard to find a negative account of the Orthodox missionaries in Alaska. And to this day, the Alouette people are 80% Orthodox. Um, now they were almost wiped out by uh, disease, like all the poor natives um, when the Europeans got them. But, um, and they, uh, actually it was uh, Mr. Gilbert's friend from college is now uh, the Russian Orthodox priest in Juneau. And he was saying that like, um, yeah, I mean, it's still, it's, it is the religion of the people. Um, no one's going to church, but it is the religion of the people. So that's what they're working on. He's at a historic church that was built in the um, very early 1800s. Uh, and so, yeah, they're, they're, they're really interesting. Now, they don't last. Um, Russia starts to realize that the uh, Alaskan company is too expensive. They kill all the otters, <laughs> so they're not as interested in being there anymore. And uh, eventually they sell it to the Americans and uh, don't really have a presence there anymore. But the church does stay. Yeah. But down in Texas, there's a lot. Mm-hmm. The Baptists just keep reaching for the frontier. Okay. Yeah, so, because they keep getting kicked out, so then they, they go to the frontier. I also, I meant to mention, too, another defining feature that I think I just had not thought of is even for those who wanted to stay within an ecclesiastical fold, like the Anglicans, um, the entire colonies are deeply under-pastored. Like, there are not a lot of learned, educated pastors, and there's certainly not any bishops. Like, just nobody comes, right? There's, there's not enough people to do it. And so you depend on these circuit riders who, um, like Dr. Reynolds' grandfather was a circuit rider. They go, like, you may see a, a pastor once every two months. And so the lay people have to rely on their own ability to read the Bible, to sing together, and to teach. And so you have this very, like, theology of the layman that's very natural because there just aren't that many pastors. Um, but then this becomes kind of hard to kick off um, once there are pastors. The pastors are like, listen to me, and they're like, or we don't have to. Um, we'll start our own church over there. And so as you see um, expansion westward and you see frontier religion, it gets wilder and wilder because everybody who gets kicked out of anything else just keeps going that way. <laughs> All right, well, oh, yeah. Is there a connection? What is the connection between the abolitionist method and the um, so there is a debate um, throughout many Christian denominations. In almost every Christian denomination, there are abolitionists and there are slaveholders. Um, the Puritans tend to be the most abolitionist. Like, they, they never take on slaves. Um, but there are, there are avid Methodist abolitionists. There are avid Anglican ab- abolitionists. There are avid Catholic abolitionists who are all preaching against slavery and then those who are defending it. So it stays pretty mixed bag for a long time. Though I think uh, John Brown is a Methodist. Yeah. Wild John Brown. All right. Well, thank you guys. <laughs>